Okay, um, thank you very much, Sumati. It's a great pleasure to be here at this meeting. Um, and uh, thank you also to the other organizers, Rob and others, for uh, inviting me. So let's see, I, I, hopefully you can see my iPad screen now and the title, uh, and you can hear me okay. Um, actually, uh, from uh, what Sumati told me, this is uh, my talk is is tutorial, and uh, so the first lecture will be really on uh, very old things, things not even from the century or even by me, although I'll give a little spin on it. Uh, and the second lecture tomorrow will be a little more uh, modern and um, more current topics. So this is just meant to be, you know, like a lecture in a classroom, and so I hope we can approximate that atmosphere and I encourage you to I don't mind interruptions just just ask anytime uh, and speak up okay uh, all right so what I thought I'd do is is talk about a topic that uh, is really central to many issues in quantum condensed matter um, it eventually lead, led to uh, many developments on emergent gauge fields and topological effects uh, which I'll only touch on very briefly today uh, but I thought it's also, you know, there's a lot of jargon, at least I found when uh, when I came into this field uh, on this work. And uh, it's uh, help, I thought it'd be helpful to just clarify the jargon and just go over the very basics uh, of the Kondo effect uh, and how it's been central to many developments in physics, uh, let's say, in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay. Um, so, so these notes are posted on the on the website, um, uh, and uh, so I'll be skipping through them and scribbling things on them. But I hope you can download the notes and uh, read them carefully for uh, any uh, you know at your leisure. Okay. Uh, so, what is the condo model? The condo model was introduced to describe you know simple impurities like uh, manganese and copper. Um, and what was observed was that at low temperature, the effect of these impurities uh, was very strong. Uh, somehow the presence of a free spin uh, interacting with the Fermi surface of the metal uh, led to some singular effects. And uh, so I want to just describe those singular, singular effects a little bit uh, and how, in fact, you know, understanding those singular effects is really crucial to many things in condensed matter. Uh, in fact, it was one of the first problems to which the renormalization group was applied to by uh, Wilson. And of course, today we have a complete understanding of the simple quantum effect, uh, but we there are a lot of interesting offshoots uh, when you take more than one impurity, which we'll get to later. So let's just start uh, with a very simple model, just free electrons, uh, the so-called resonant level model. So you have some electrons which are called C alpha at some density, which are moving uh, on a lattice of sites. This is some, not necessarily one dimension, generally in higher than one dimension, but uh, my poor impression is just a one dimensional uh, section of it. And here's an impurity, uh, an extra site uh, with, a, with an electron I'll call D. So there's just one state on this site, which is can be spin up or spin down uh, or doubly occupied or empty. Uh, so really, sorry, so there are four possible states on this site. Uh, and there's a tunneling matrix element uh, from this site to one given site uh, on on this on the conduction band, as we call it. So C is the conduction band, and this is the you know represents the manganese ion, um, and we call it the d orbital. Okay. Uh, so the explicit Hamiltonian is right here. Um, so there's there's some dispersion epsilon of k of these conduction bands, uh, which goes through zero. Zero is the Fermi level. Um, and then there's the D level here. It's got some energy, which I'll call epsilon D. Uh, right now, there's no interactions at all. And there's this uh, tunneling matrix element from the D side to the zero side uh, of the conduction electron. So this is the zero side here. Okay. Uh, so this is in momentum space. This is in real space. Uh, but of course, uh, there's a simple relationship between them uh, connecting the site to momentum space. All right, so this problem is free electrons, so it's no problem solving, uh, learning everything about it. Uh, we're interested in the limit where W is small, uh, so the mixing is not weak, and then that's why this is called the resonant level. It's, it's really some 
like a nucleus, uh, which has some level, and then uh, it can decay into the continuum, uh, which is over here with the amplitude W. All right, so let's write down the Green's functions. Uh, that's very simple. Uh, this is the entire Feynman diagrams. Uh, if you want the D electron Green's function, you start with D, then you get the matrix element W and you go to the conduction band with momentum K, K1, and then back to D and K2 and so on. And this is the conduction band uh, set of Green's function and you can just sum it all up. Uh, and the basic result from the first result here is that the on-site Green's function of the D electron uh, is the bare Green's function uh, plus the self energy coming from the D electron going to the conduction band and then coming back. Uh, and, uh, and that gives you this term right here, matrix element squared and the propagator of the conduction band. So we're going to just convert the summation of our momentum to an integral over energy uh, multiplied by the density of states. Uh, and then furthermore, we're just going to approximate the density of states by a constant because we're going to be near the Fermi level. Uh, so you just do this integral, assume the density of state is symmetric. Uh, and so therefore the evaluation is purely uh, imaginary uh, and it just becomes uh, this, uh, this form here, I gamma sine of omega N. Uh, and so the I indicates it's going to be, a that's the lifetime of the state gamma is the inverse lifetime. Uh, and it's just at least one over, um, two gamma inverse lifetime, uh, and gamma is pi W squared times the density of states. Uh, that's a result you can, that's the standard formula that you can also get from Fermi's golden rule. So if you look at uh, the density of states on the side, you get a Lorentzian uh, with, uh, with gamma. So, you know, as a function of energy, um, right at the energy ED, uh, you have a Lorentzian uh, and the width of this thing is, is gamma. All right, so that's the resonant level. And this can become a very sharp uh, resonance um, but when gamma becomes small or W becomes small, uh, but uh, you know, the, uh, it's not a bound state. Uh, there's always some probability that you'll decay uh, out into the continuum. Okay, uh, just to continue belaboring the point, there's a few more things you can now establish. Uh, you can uh, also compute the conduction electron Green's function. This is, with, uh, if I don't put a subscript, it means implicitly it's C electron Green's function. Uh, and that's given by these graphs. Uh, and so you can work that out. There's now two contributions. Now it's a little bit tricky because you have, one of them seems to be smaller by a factor of volume, which is important. Uh, so this is just a free electron in the bulk, uh, which conserves momentum. But the one that's down by a factor of volume, uh, which is due to the presence of a single impurity, I mean, this is not thermodynamically a significant effect, uh, but still, if you're measuring the properties of the impurity, uh, then this term will be important. Um, and it involves the same GDD and two propagators of the conduction electron. So one thing you can now ask, what is the change uh, in the electron density uh, due to the, at the impurity site. No, what is the change in the total electron density due to the presence of this extra orbital? So what you do is you just compute uh, the density of the D band and the density of the conduction electron. And then you subtract out the original density of electrons, which is of course, uh, the biggest contribution, but you subtract it out. And so you're gonna get an answer of order one. And then you notice from these formula, uh, something very neat uh, that everything can be written as the logarithmic derivative of GDD. This is a standard trick that comes in when you prove the Luttinger theorem. And here I'm proving what's called the Friedel sum rule. Uh, so this, you can evaluate this uh, once. So now it's, now it's in a frequency integral of a total derivative. So after some tricks in control integration, you can evaluate it. Uh, and this is the answer that you get. Uh, and this quantity here uh, for, for the Green's functions that we have written down here, uh, you can evaluate it. Uh, and in the end, uh, you get this answer. 
uh, which is the change in density is one minus a quantity, which is related actually to the phase shift of the scattering. So delta rho uh, versus ED. Okay, I, I presume this will work out. <laughs> uh, when ED is you know very large and negative, when it's minus infinity, uh, delta rho is two, and when it's plus infinity, uh, it goes down to zero. And that's easy to understand. You have this uh, level. If it's well below the Fermi level, uh, you're going to put two electrons in it, and it's well above the Fermi level. You put no electrons in it. Um, and I think this works out, uh, yes, uh, if you evaluate this expression right here, uh, as ED varies as the level of the D electron varies. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So you can compute some other things. Uh, you can compute this uh, response to a magnetic field. So suppose you apply a magnetic field to the system. Uh, the magnetic field will couple via the Zeeman term to the total spin. Uh, and of course, the bulk contribution is the Pauli contribution due to all the other electrons, but you're interested in the, the change due to one impurity. Uh, and you can compute it, and that turns out to be basically given by the density of states um, at the Fermi level. Oh no, that's the Pauli contribution. Uh, the impurity contribution, which is what we're interested in, uh, turns out to be given by the uh, this expression here, uh, and that's just essentially the density of states of the D level. So uh, when you're at resonance, when ED is zero, the susceptibility, it's a very large susceptibility, so there's a huge effect when you're exactly at the Fermi level. Uh, that's because, you know, so you have, a, you have a continuum of levels here, and here's your little level at energy ED. Uh, and if this is the Fermi level, uh, as you change the colors, uh, these are the occupied states. And this, so this thing, can, when it's right at, uh, at the Fermi level, it's a half, a half as likely to have a spin up and a spin down in it. Half the time it's got a spin up, uh, spin up or a spin down, and that has a uh, susceptibility, which is one over temperature. But when you average over the fact that it's, there's a lifetime, you get a large contribution, which is one over gamma. Okay, so that's a lot of time to spend on this free electrons and hopefully you're all with me and uh, if there's any quick questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Okay, uh, so the reason I spend a lot of time on this is uh, it turns out that much of the physics of the interacting system can also be understood by very sim similar expression, except that the value of gamma is going to be very different. The value of gamma, the width of the level, uh, gets to normalize strongly uh, as a function of temperature. And, and that's basically the Kondo effect. So it'll take a little bit of a few steps to, to show that. Uh, and then eventually I will relate it to emergent gauge fields, which is the topic of this uh, conference. So let's take the same model and just add an interaction. So this is the resonant level model that um, I just talked about. That should be RLM, sorry. Uh, here's the resonant level model, and then I just add an interaction uh, only on the impurity side. Uh, you can add interactions on the in of the conduction electrons, and it doesn't change very much. So we just keep our life simple uh, and just add an interaction on the impurity side. And this turns out to have a huge effect. Okay. Uh, so because of the interaction now, you can see from the general structure of the graphs, um, that the main thing that's going to appear um, is a self energy sigma dd in the g in the d electron Green's function, um, and it's we want to understand what this sigma dd is uh, from the interactions. This is the decay rate just due to the free electron behavior, but now there's a self energy. Okay, uh, but one thing you realize that actually uh, this thing. Um, uh, the 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 sum rule, in fact, in the end doesn't change uh, because when you compute, so when what happens is when you compute the total change in uh, uh, density, and this is very much related to the Ludinger theorem that we're going to get to, 
when you compute the change in density due to the presence of impurity, like here, you know, I went from here to there. And that's just a simple identity that you can check is correct for the expressions I've written down. But when you add the self energy, there's an additional contribution here. And what that additional contribution uh, looks like, it involves, of course, the self energy. Uh, and if you just work it out, it's this, this kind of expression. And then it's a standard result in many body theories, uh, which follows from the existence of what's called the Luttinger functional, that this thing is zero. Uh, and it's, this, it's precisely this result that leads to all the deep theorems on Luttinger, uh, uh, the Luttinger theorem being an example of them, which uh, I'll say more about later. And I think Senthil is also going to give a very different point of view in his lectures. But very quickly, uh, so you know, why is this thing zero? Okay, so let me add another page here. If I remember how to do it. Uh, yeah. Where am I? Okay. So the the result we have is d omega. Uh, G, G, I'll drop the DD, uh, D sigma D omega uh, equals zero. Well, so this result follows from the existence of what's called the Luttinger Watt functional, uh, which is that sigma of omega uh, is the derivative of some functional of G. Uh, with respect to G. So if there's such a functional that exists so that the derivative of phi of G is sigma, then if you plug this in here, you find that this vanishes. Um, and the reason this vanishes is actually related to the following fact. Uh, if you have some functional of G, which is a function of omega, uh, well, that functional has the same value if you shift all the frequencies of the Green's function by some fixed omega naught. So from this, you have the result that d by d omega naught uh, of the functional phi of g of omega plus omega naught uh, is equal to zero. So if you now just do some simple algebra from, from this and integrate by parts, you can, uh, you can get this result. Um, okay, and the reason I'm belaboring this is this kind of shows you uh, sort of a connection uh, to something in particle physics, uh, something called an Etouffe anomaly. It's a rough connection here, which Senthil will elaborate on in much greater detail, uh, that you have a global symmetry. So the global symmetry in the system um, is that C goes to uh, C to some angle, E to the I alpha. So there's a U1 symmetry, which corresponds to conservation of particle number. And everything is related to this U1 symmetry. Uh, but if you want G, the Green's function to go, or G of omega, you want G of omega uh, to go to G of omega plus omega naught, uh, we are doing, you're taking this global symmetry and you're changing your C uh, by a time, the function of time. The electron operator. So you're performing, you're taking a global symmetry and gauging it to this very simple linear dependence on time. And so the properties of the Lagrangian with respect to this change are what in the end responsible for everything. So, so that's very much the spirit of what an Atuft anomaly is. All right, okay. So that's just an aside uh, to, to show you where, you know, how, how this thing is actually very much connected to many other things. Uh, in the in the physics of anomalies, and of course, Senthil will say much more about it uh, in his lecture today. I think. All right. So where were we? So we took the resonant level model, uh, and we added some interactions. Okay. So let's just go ahead uh, and make the interactions large. Uh, when the interactions are weak, you know things don't happen. Very, uh, not that singular. But let's take, make the interactions large. So if the interactions are large, uh, then what happens is that there are, just, just look at the states on, on the D sites. There's the empty state, which has energy zero. 
So that's over here, let's say, that's the empty state. Uh, there's the single electron state, which has energy epsilon d, and I'm going to put it over here because epsilon d is going to be less than uh, zero. So this is the state epsilon d, singly occupied. It can be either spin up or spin down. And then there's the doubly occupied states, which is which I'm going to put up here, which is spin up and down. So this is the empty state with energy zero. Uh, the doubly occupied side is 2ed plus u. So now the condo effect occurs when these two states are much lower in energy than those two states. So we're going to, and that will happen if epsilon d is negative and of order u d over two. So basically that's the most optimal situation where epsilon d uh, is close to minus u d over two uh, and u d goes to infinity. So if you take that limit, which is naturally found in many materials, uh, then you can ignore all these, these states and you reduce everything to a qubit, just a spin a half with two states sitting on that side. Um, so that's the condo model and pictured here. So there's just two states and I can take any linear combination of them uh, to get a spin that points in any direction that I'll call SD. Um, and now this, this spin will interact with the conduction electron. Okay, so to figure out that interaction, you have to do some perturbation theory because the only term in the uh, Hamiltonian uh, that couples the D side to the conduction electron is the matrix element W. Uh, and what you notice is that the W matrix element, you know, takes you from a singly occupied site to an empty site or vice versa, or it can even take you to the W occupied site. There's no matrix element taking you directly uh, from here to here. But if you go to order W squared, uh, then you're going to get a process where you're going to go up and then come down uh, and so on. So you're going to end up rotating or flipping the spin and the matrix element for flipping the spin uh, will be uh, W squared divided by the gap, which is UT. Okay, so uh, when you go through that calculation, which is something I urge everyone to do, if you haven't never done it, it's a second order perturbation theory. Um, and then you find uh, the, con the famous Condo Hamiltonian. You have a spin coupled to the spin of the conduction electrons on the origin with a coupling JK, uh, which is positive in, with this sign of writing it. So it's called an antiferromagnetic coupling. So to lower the energy, the spin of the uh, impurity side likes to be opposite to the spin of the conduction electron. Uh, and the value of JK is uh, right here. Okay. Okay, any questions? So now we have derived the condo Hamiltonian from uh, what's often called the Anderson model. And this transformation is called the Schieffer-Wolf transformation. All right, so now we want to understand something about the condo model. And so the first thing you want to do is perturbation theory in JK, uh, which is actually what uh, uh, Condo did in the 60s. Uh, he was stimulated by some experimental observations by uh, Miriam Sarachik. Uh, and uh, then he started thinking about the effect of a single spin in the presence of a conduction electron from EC and he did perturbation theory in JK. And he famously found uh, that there's a logarithmic divergence. Um, and this is actually, you know, in some ways quite similar to the log divergence of QCD, uh, except it, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sir? Yeah, yes. Uh, sir, in this case, you are referring to the interaction, which is a uh, ferromagnetic type, right? The, uh, the impurity is uh, ferromagnetically coupled to the uh, resonant level, right? Uh, no, with positive JK, it's antiferromagnetic. Antiferromagnetic. So had it been a tunnel, uh, tunnel coupled uh, scenario there also, I mean, would this fit in? Tunnel coupled. Uh, so, you know, I, I started with this, the, our Hamiltonian yeah. is the Hamiltonian in this picture, yeah. uh, which is way back here. Yeah, so this is the Hamiltonian we started with. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing we've added to this picture, the tunneling coupling is W between the impurity site and the conduction electron. Uh, the only thing I've added uh, is a U, U times D dagger, D dagger, D. Yes, yes. That's, this, is the, this is the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. And this particular Hamiltonian always gives you an anti-ferromagnetic coupling. And, and the reason it does that, you know, just you can kind of see uh, very simply, uh, suppose it was ferromagnetic, suppose both spins were up, suppose this spin was up and this spin was up. Well, if, there's, if they're both up, then it's impossible for uh, this spin to hop there and come back. On the other hand, if it's one is up and the other is down, uh, if this is down, uh, then it's possible at least although it costs some energy for this to go there and come back. And that lowers its energy. So they like to be anti-parallel. But the analysis that I'm just now going to show you works for either sign of JK. In some some materials, for other reasons, this is a very simple model. For other reasons, it could be that JK is ferromagnetic. But in this model, the Anderson model, it's always anti-ferromagnetic. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we just do perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, so this now perturbation theory is a little tricky because you don't have Wick's theorem. Uh, you know, you can certainly apply Wick's theorem to the conduction electrons if you like, uh, but there's no Wick's theorem for spins. So you have to do time ordered perturbation theory the old fashioned way, where you just actually expand out the time ordered exponential. Uh, uh, and then take traces over over the spin operators. Uh, so it's a little laborious, but it's doable. I mean, in fact, it shows you that you know you you can't you can't rely on Wick's theorem all the time, uh, and still you can still make progress. So anyway, so you but you're just doing perturbation theory too in in JK. So I, I've outlined here one way to do it, and there's many other ways to do it, but I I won't go through it. Uh, here's the kind of pictures you can still draw some Feynman diagrams. Uh, so here, the full line is the spin. The spin. This is the time trajectory of the spin, and this is the time trajectory of the conduction electrons. And so we're just looking at the renormalization uh, of this JK to second order in JK. And I was just looking at what happens to this coupling. Uh, okay. And now there's a very sophisticated way of doing this, and in fact. The whole problem is also Bethian's that's integrable. But anyway, what Kondo did was this kind of perturbation theory. Uh, and what he found, if you do perturbation theory and you look at the renormalized JK, so all the graphs are here, and you know, I I have I haven't hidden anything. Uh, you can just go through the algebra here and work it out for yourself. Uh, what you find is that there is uh, the JK gets uh, if we just do bare perturbation theory, uh, you, the effect of the JK gets enhanced by this extra term. And if you integrate over all the conduction electrons, you notice a, a log divergence. Okay. Um, and, and so what this, which is then cut off by the temperature or some external source. So what you find is that uh, any physical property you measure, like say the resistance, uh, due to scattering of conduction electron of this impurity gets enhanced uh, by a term that has a log T in it. So as T goes to zero, it becomes essentially infinite. All right, so Kondo in his paper just did the perturbation theory and then he's made the usual physicist statement. Uh, when can you t- trust per- perturbation theory? You can trust perturbation theory when uh, this term uh, is smaller than the first term. And he found that this term was smaller than the first term, only above a certain temperature, uh, which is called the condo temperature, of course. And we'll estimate that in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, but then uh, Anderson and Yuval came around and said, no, the way to do this is to think uh, in, in the renormalization group language. Uh, this is really very early days of the RG. Uh, and said that what you should do when you're invaluating these graphs is not integrate over all the conduction electrons, but only a sliver of them. You know, so you have uh, some density of states of the conduction electrons. This is the density of states. Uh, these are the occupied states, D of E. 
So we are looking at virtual excitations, uh, you know, hole-like excitations here and particle-like excitations there. Uh, and what Anderson and Yuval said uh, is that you should only integrate out uh, just a small sliver of them here and here. Uh, and that width was delta uh, delta D. Or, or sorry, the D is the bandwidth. Okay, yeah. D is the bandwidth and D of E is the density of, little d of E is the band, is the density of state. So, sorry, I should change that to little d of E. Oh, anyway, everything is consistent in the notes. <laughs> okay, so from that, you derive an RG equation. Uh, how does JK change as you change the bandwidth? So the change in bandwidth, uh, you say is delta L, proportional to delta L. Uh, and then you find a, an RG equation that GJK DL is JK squared. Okay, so it becomes large as you go to lower energies. And coincidentally, that's also the RG equation uh, of QCD. The gauge coupling constant QCD becomes very large as you um, as you go to very low energies. So in QCD. Our interpretation is that gauge coupling becoming large is uh, is the onset of confinement. Uh, and there's also something like confinement here, where the spin, which is free to rotate at high temperatures uh, and give you a large Curie susceptibility, just disappears, gets confined into the Fermi C. Uh, and as we'll see, it's, it's actually better interpreted as a Higgs phenomenon rather than a confinement phenomenon. but as many of you know, Higgs and confinement are smoothly connected. Okay, so anyway, so this is telling you the same, something that at one level that uh, Kondo already knew, um, that you cannot trust perturbation theory below a certain energy scale. It doesn't really tell you much more than that. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it gives a nice interpretation, but it doesn't tell you what happens at large JK. Uh, Okay, so, but you can just integrate this equation. Um, and the integral of that equation is this uh, result right here. Uh, so L equals zero is where you start and you're integrating out slowly, uh, reducing the bandwidth of the electrons. Uh, and there's a correction. And now you see that JK goes to infinity when the denominator blows up at some finite L, which we call L star. Uh, and then what is the energy scale associated with that? The energy scale is the bandwidth times D of time E to the minus L star. And that's what we call the condo temperature. And so here's the estimate of the condo temperature. It's some overall energy scale like the bandwidth time exponential of minus one over the condo coupling, the bare condo coupling times uh, D of zero. And that also is very much like QCD, the uh, lambda QCD, the mass scale at which confinement effects take over uh, is e to the minus uh, one over g, g squared in that case uh, of uh, non abelian gauge theories. Okay. So that's, you know, in fact, historically, this is one of the reasons there's so much interest here because this is an example of a situation where now, you know, you have at least a complete description uh, of the confinement uh, process, not just a perturbative description. Okay, so we don't really know what happens at large JK, but you can uh, make a few guesses. And, uh, you know, uh, Nozier was especially one who made some very inspired guesses that uh, helped us understand what happens at large JK. Um, I won't go into it. Um, let's see, what do I say here? Yeah, so what you can, so what happens in large JK? what you think would happen. Uh, well, here we have a very simple model. Uh, where's the condo problem? So where JK is becoming very large, yeah, here. So what have, So let's just do perturbation theory when JK goes to infinity. So unlike UCD, we can, we can still treat that limit. So as JK goes to infinity, well, what's going to happen? Well, the, uh, if you want, since JK is the largest coupling, What's going to happen is that a conduction electron will come by and sit here, and the two of them will form a singlet. Okay, so that'll be the singlet state uh, of the conduction electron um, sitting here. And they'll be in some excited states, which are higher in energy, 
but they are higher energy by JK, and JK has gone to infinity. Uh, and these excited states would be the triplet states with both of them up, so on. Okay, so effectively what's happened uh, because of as JK goes to infinity, uh, the spin has disappeared, but so has one conduction electron. And as far as the rest of the conduction electron is concerned, uh, this is like a hard sphere sitting at the origin. Now, now here it's important to imagine they're in higher dimensions. So, you know, as conduction electrons are going around, they'll just go around this. Uh, and so it it's really becomes a potential scattering problem and the impurity is not there. It's basically disappeared. There's no spin left over. Uh, and so this, the effective theory for this will be very much like the resonant level model uh, because you just got uh, one impurity, you know, you know, which is uh, essentially a zero energy uh, in, in a free electron uh, back. And there's nothing left there to excite except by, by paying an energy cost of JK, which has become very large at effectively at low temperatures. So that's the confining state where the impurity confines uh, peels off one electron from the bulk, and then this, this, this site kind of disappears from the problem. Okay. Um, and so you can try to estimate what are some of the properties of this impurity when JK has become very large. Uh, so let's see, what did I say? Okay. Okay. Uh, so we can, for example, try to compute this chi impurity. Uh, apply a magnetic field and look at the response. Now at very high temperatures where you can uh, uh, trust perturbation theory, so it is remarkable, uh, reliable. So you can just do perturbation theory at JK. Well, to zero order in JK, you just have a free spin and that will give you a Curie susceptibility, one over 40. Um, and so that's diverging. So if I look at the susceptibility, uh, so if I plot um, chi of t, um, temperature, and here's my condo temperature, um, and my UD is out at infinity. So my temperatures between, there's a huge window of temperatures between UD and TK. Uh, and in this region, I expect this, to, it's just like a free spin, which is one over 40. Okay, so what happens? Well, I've already discussed what happens at very low temperature where JK goes to infinity, the free spin goes away. Uh, and you're just left with some bound up singlet, which is weakly bound because the temperature, condo temperature is quite small we are measuring things in units of the condo temperature. That's what it means to say JK has gone to infinity. Uh, and so that will, you know, it's not there. So it can't give you a divergence susceptibility. So the most natural guess uh, is that this thing, sorry, uh, this thing saturates. Uh, and the value here is let's call it one over four TK. In fact, you can just view that as a definition of the condo temperature. So your chi of T, uh, will be some one over TK times some function of T over TK. So the natural scale uh, for the susceptibility uh, is the condo temperature. Uh, and the response function is some universal function of T over TK. We have no idea what this function is. Uh, this is something RG doesn't tell you very much about, except in the high temperature limit, which is the analog of the asymptotically free regime. Uh, but what happens as T goes to zero, which is the analog of the confinement regime is you get a finite one over TK response. Uh, but if I go back now and look at the resonant level model, and, and I, you may recall, I told you what the uh, local susceptibility was. Um, it was, uh, well, uh, yeah, chi imp is one over gamma. So now I'm finding it's one over TK. So the bottom line is when the dust is settled, that the JK goes to infinity model uh, looks very much like uh, a resonant level model with no interactions. 
uh, with gamma, the width of the level uh, given by Condor temperature, you know, which is bandwidth times e to the minus one over jk as jk goes to infinity. Now remember that jk goes to infinity, uh, strangely enough, uh, jk is of order w squared over u. Uh, so, so strangely enough, this is actually jk going to infinity small u, but of course this is all a question. Uh, the small u and the large u problem are smoothly connected. Uh, and uh, the only difference is that at small u, the band, the lifetime is w, w squared. Uh, and at large u, it's given by this very small number, uh, the e to the minus jk. So the resonant level, the, the effect of interactions greatly sharpened uh, the resonance at the Fermi level. The width of the resonance of the condo temperature, not the bare value. But apart from that very strong energy scalar normalization, the physics is not that different. Okay, so, so that's uh, basically all the physics of the condo model. Uh, but, you know, it's a bit unsatisfactory because I haven't told you how to compute these functions uh, and so on. Uh, today, these functions can be computed exactly by the Bethe-Ansatz method, which I will not talk about. Uh, what I will turn to next uh, is to talk about uh, a large N expansion, uh, which of course, uh, where N, the physical value of N is two, but we uh, go to SU, generalize SU2 to SUN, and just look at the limit of large N. So that turns out to be very useful because it actually gives you a lot of physical insight that you can generalize to more complicated problems. Uh, and also gives you an interpretation of what's going on, uh, as we'll see, as a as a Higgs phenomenon. Uh, but any questions on the basic physics of the condo effect that I've gone through rather quickly? Okay. I'm assuming you can all hear me clearly and everything, right? <laughs> okay. So what is the large end theory? Uh, so the large end theory uh, is to just take the spin of SU2 and generalize it to SUN um, and then send N to infinity. And in that limit, um, this problem can be solved. So what you do, well, first of all, you have to rewrite the Pauli matrices for general N. Uh, that's a little tedious. It's easier to use this identity relate a poly product of two poly matrices to some delta functions. Uh, then the interaction uh, between the spin and the conduction electrons, we call the electrons sitting on the spin side F, these are the F electrons, uh, rather than D, because just to, uh, as we'll see, these F electrons have a constraint. They can only, they have to be exactly one F electron for SU2 on, on the purity side. So if you insert this identity in here, uh, you get this term here. Now this is just uh, this is just one because you have exactly one electron on this on the site. Uh, so this is just one, and that's just some potential scattering term. So we just throw that away. Uh, and we keep this term. And the nice thing about this term is now it has sum over alpha and beta from one to two. And all we have to do is generalize that to, to large n. Okay, and the number of electrons, uh, number of F fermions, I should say, which I'm now going to call spin-ons because these are fermions associated with the spin. For SU2, that has to be one, uh, but for SUN, we make the choice to make it n over two because that's the nice particle hole symmetric case. So finally, we have our Hamiltonian, which I will write down here. Our Hamiltonian uh, is the conduction electron, some on K, uh, some dispersion, C dagger K alpha, C K alpha. Here, alpha goes from one through N, not two, plus J K, and you have, it pays to put a factor of one over N here, uh, times, F dagger 
alpha C zero alpha uh, mod squared. So that's uh, this term here uh, is just exactly this term there. Uh, and oh, sorry, and there's implied sum over alpha inside. Let me put that in. Okay. All right, so that's the Hamiltonian uh, for SUN spins. Uh, and now we can actually treat this through a standard large N method. Um, you write a path integral for this Hamiltonian. Um, and here's the path integral. You have the, uh, now there's an integral over the spin on F alpha, the conduction electrons. And then there's a Lagrange multiplier lambda uh, and that imposes the constraint. If you look at the lambda integral, it's an I lambda times F dagger F minus N over two. So this constraint uh, is imposed by lambda. When you do the integral over lambda, you get a delta function. Uh, and then you have uh, the interaction right here. All right, so this is the path integral we need to evaluate. Uh, and the simplest way to evaluate this is to take this term and decouple it by the hubbard chitanovich transformation. So you introduce a field P of tau, uh, and then, uh, then this part of the Hamiltonian, this uh, L1 uh, becomes LQ, and LQ is this here. And all, we've, all you can now check is if you do the integral over P, this is the Gaussian integral over P, you'll get back this. But we want to keep it this way. Uh, so you have an integral over a field P and P is what we're going to call the hybridization. It's the analog of the W field uh, that we started the lecture with, where you had the tunneling W between uh, the impurity resonant level uh, and the conduction electron. Uh, so W was given, but now P is a fluctuating field is playing the role of W. Uh, it has this additional term here that we have to integrate over. Okay, the advantage of doing this now is that the remaining, all the terms in the Lagrangian, uh, the free terms here and these terms here, the terms that depend on the fermions are just free fermion terms. So you can just evaluate the path integral over the free fermions and you're left with the path integral over lambda and P. Okay, so then you get some uh, trace log and a complicated expression is not, uh, no need to write that out. Uh, but the important thing you notice then is that everything has a prefactor of N in front of it. This term has a prefactor of N, this term has a prefactor of N. And when I do the path integral over the fermions, I do the path integral over the different spins independently. This is alpha, 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 alpha. alpha. There's no beta anywhere. So just have a product of alpha that gives you another factor of n. So I get some path, some, some action with an n out front. And so at large n, I can just look at the saddle point, which is all I'll do for now. Okay, but before uh, I do that, I forgot to mention this particular path integral um, has a U1 gauge symmetry where you rotate F alpha uh, by E to the I phi of tau, P also by phi of tau, and lambda by shift, like this. And so what you notice is that lambda, this Lagrange multiplier, uh, looks like the time component of, of a gauge field. You have some gauge field, U1 gauge field, and there's only a time component here. So this is a gauge theory, but it's a very simple gauge theory in zero space-time dimensions, uh, zero time dimension, zero space dimension, excuse me, one time dimension. And there's a gauge field, A tau, uh, which is just the Lagrange multiplier. Um, and okay, in this case, you can gauge fix it, but it's useful to, to think in this language uh, because when we go to the lattice, uh, this is uh, becomes very, very useful. So you have a emergent U1 gauge symmetry, uh, and then you have a fermion, which carries charge under this gate symmetry. And you have a boson P that we introduced, the hybridization, which also carries charge in the gate symmetry. 
Okay, so now what we're going to see is when you look at the large end saddle point, uh, P condenses. So P is going to be not equal to zero. Uh, and that's precisely uh, the Higgs phase. And it's the condensation of P uh, that gets rid of the free spin uh, and gives you in the end uh, just a resonant level model because you can just see that Lagrangian is the resonant level Hamiltonian. That Lagrangian for C and F is exactly the resonant level Hamiltonian that I began my lecture with, except P has replaced W. Okay, so now it's just a matter of figuring out the value of P and W uh, and lambda at the saddle point. We're going to replace these by a saddle point, uh, and you have to know the values of P and lambda. All right, so that's a very standard calculation uh, of these kinds of large end theories. Uh, all the steps are spelled out in the notes. And since I'm running out of time, I will uh, just go ahead to the saddle point equations. So the saddle point I call P bar, and the saddle point of I lambda will call lambda bar. Okay, so you get the saddle point equations, uh, and they are right here. So this equation turns out to be very easy. And the F electron Green's function, GFF, looks exactly like GDD of the resident level model, uh, except the gamma has now been replaced by gamma P, exactly where we press W by P bar. So it's like a resonant level. The, the spin-ons uh, have become a resonant level of width gamma P. Uh, and then from this, you see that uh, to get exactly half filling, you can just put lambda bar equal to zero. That's the particle hole symmetric case. So we're just left with one parameter to determine, P bar. Uh, and you're going to get an equation for P bar. Okay, so that equation is this equation, and then you just take all the Green's functions that I've written down for you. You know, nothing's been put under the rug here. Just work it all out. Uh, use some spectral functions. Uh, and in the end, this is the equation for P bar. So P bar is equal to this. And this is very similar to the PCS gap equation uh, that you get for uh, superconductivity here. There you're, you have a pairing gap that's forming. Here there's a hybridization or a Higgs field P bar that's condensing. Uh, and also quite interestingly, uh, you find a log divergence in here when, because of the density of states and the peculiar way uh, in all, which all of these sums appear. But I only a few minutes left, so I won't uh, go through it. Anyway, so you get this equation, um, and I've said lambda bar is zero, and you try to evaluate this, you get a log divergence. Uh, and so finally you get, oh, okay. The other thing to note is that one solution um, is always P bar equals zero, but you reject that solution because it's a high energy solution. Uh, what you want to rather do is, break the U1 gate symmetry and condense P bar. Uh, and when you condense P bar, you get uh, the value of P bar and after some algebra, uh, what you find is not so P bar as gamma P, the width uh, is the condo temperature, which is what I said earlier, which we had kind of guessed on physical grounds and you can actually see that and compute that, uh, including factors of pi and two, at least in the large end limit. Okay, uh, questions? Okay. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. I'm not hearing a word. <laughs> so I have about five minutes left. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, oh. go ahead, please. Do we have a spin one condo physics? Uh, you have said about only spin half. Uh, yes, you do. Um, so I think, um, yeah. Um, so what happens in spin one, if I remember right? Somebody can correct me. If you take this, uh, this simple picture that I drew over here, where was that?
Yeah, so suppose this was spin one and JK went to infinity, which you will find at this order in perturbation theory, uh, then you'll want to form uh, a state between the conduction electron and this extra electron here. But since this is spin one, uh, this is spin one and that's spin a half, uh, this tightly bound state won't be spin zero, it will be spin a half. So you'll get screened down from spin one down to spin a half. So now you can say, okay, I have a, a net spin a half sitting here and that should interact with the C, conduction C. Well, but when you figure out its interaction with the conduction C, you find, I believe, if I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory is that uh, it's ferromagnetic. So in fact, when you have a ferromagnetic sign, then there's no further condo screening. You just go down from spin one to spin a half. Uh, and that the fact that there's no condo screening for ferromagnetic interactions is something that's also evident uh, from this RG equation. If you look at the flow of this RG equation uh, for antiferromagnetic interaction, if you're antiferromagnetic, you go to infinity. But if you're ferromagnetic, you go to zero. You go back to zero and you stop here. Uh, so the ferromagnetic condo problem is kind of trivial. Uh, nothing happens really. You can just do perturbation theory and, and to find, and the spin is present all the way down to zero temperature. And there's a curious susceptibility uh, at zero temperature. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good question. Any other questions? Simple questions are also allowed. <laughs> Okay, all right, but let me just introduce, uh, I have not got as far as I wanted to, but that's all right. Um, let me just introduce the condo lattice problem, uh, which we can solve by exactly this large end method. So I hope you'll uh, look at the notes overnight when we go into the condo lattice, the large end method. So now I have a picture here. This is the condo lattice problem. I have some conduction electron, and I have uh, once in the simple picture, a spin not just on one side, but on every side. So they have uh, two bands, if you wish, the C band and uh, the F band. And on the F band, I have a spin uh, on every side. And this is now coupled to the conduction electrons. Okay, so this, and then you can, you know, so the natural inclination is to say, well, each spin will have a condo effect with the conduction electrons and each spin will disappear uh, into the conduction C. Uh, and that's actually correct uh, almost all the time. And uh, so what happens when each spin disappears in the conduction C? Well, when we have this thing called the Friedel sum rule, which now becomes the Lettinger theorem, uh, when as these spins are being absorbed into the Fermi C, uh, the size of the Fermi surface has to grow. So you're going to get uh, a very large Fermi surface, which will, whose volume will include not just the conduction electron, uh, but the spins themselves. So the volume of the Fermi surface uh, will have the conduction electron, which is density rho C, and the spins is one per site plus one. And this is the volume of the Fermi surface of what's called the heavy Fermi liquid. Uh, and that obeys the Luttinger theorem. And the way you understand that is by, again, the Higgs mechanism, why the size of the Fermi surface is larger. I'll explain that next time. Uh, and uh, so, and why is it called a heavy Fermi liquid? Well, it turns out that this very narrow energy scale, the condo energy, which is very small at small JK, uh, that condo energy scale uh, determines the effective mass on the quasi particle. So M star over M is one over the condo scale, as we'll see. Uh, and this can be easily, you know, thousand in some material like cesium cop uh, copper two silicon two. Uh, so that's why it's the heavy Fermi liquid. And so this is the, uh, you know, the canonical, and very successful theory uh, of the heavy fermion compounds, uh, starting from the condo lattice, where you get very, very heavy electrons, strongly renormalized, but because of the very low energy condo scale, uh, where the Fermi surface uh, 
counts the volume of everything. And what I'll show you at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture um, is how you can understand this and the size of the Fermi surface by a simple uh, application of uh, the Higgs mechanism uh, to uh, to this gauge theory that I just introduced. So now we're going to get now it's going to become an honest to God gauge theory because it has both space and time. Uh, so far, it was a kind of a toy gauge theory with only time and no space. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any questions right away? Uh, I guess if uh, the students have questions, you can write them in the chat or in, use the Slack and we will try at some later point to see if we can arrange a discussion session during one of the lunch breaks. Uh, so for yes, I, and also please, uh, the notes yeah. are posted, everything uh, that you saw is all, you know, everything I said is pretty much in the text so you can read it. <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Thanks. Uh, okay. So we then will.